So what's on your mind? Well, recently I was thinking back to the Bertrand Russell podcast that we did specifically about the part where we had been talking about a kind of worship of billionaires that has been happening recently. And you mentioned that in Apple, you had Steve Jobs, who was almost seen as a kind of spiritual figure. And yet in China, there are suicide nets to stop the badly treated Apple workers from killing themselves. Right, right. I remember that. Yeah. And it really made me think about just that sort of image that a corporation can present and what the truth is behind the image. And that really made me think about the Amiga and how basically while it was a more technically powerful and well, is a more technically powerful computer and more driven by grassroots creative users of it it lost the image war to the Mac. So in that connection, I started thinking back on my time using the Amiga, and I thought that maybe we should do a podcast about it. Well, that sounds great. Cool. I mean, I remember I remember when you had the Amiga. <laughs> yeah, that's a long time ago. Yeah. So I thought instead of just sort of sharing my love for the computer, that maybe it would be kind of fun to start out with someone else's love for the computer. And that would be this guy, Susumu Hirasawa, who is a rather famous Japanese musician. Right. I, I, I was listening to some of those songs that uh, you said he composed on the Amiga. Right. Uh, I'm not sure about composed on the Amiga, but... Or recorded them on the Amiga. He, he definitely, even today in 2020, there are Amigas as part of his recording setup and his uh, live setup. What, what about the videos that go with the music? Some of those were actually created on the Amiga. It's true. That was one of the things that was just so amazing about it. I'd like to get a little bit more into this a little later, but in the late 1980s, you could sit in the bedroom with this relatively inexpensive computer and create a music video. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I, I've seen a couple of those videos. Uh, so a man after my own heart, Susumu recently wrote a book about his time using the Amiga, and I thought I would excerpt, and since it's written in Japanese, translate part of it to use as the intro to this Amiga podcast. Great. So as a musician interested in audiovisual technology, very much like us, he went to Akihabara, which is the sort of technology sales capital of Tokyo, to see what computers could do for him. And this was back in 1987. This is the way he tells me. Would that? Yeah. Well, I have a question. So you tr you actually translated this. So is this the first time people are going to actually hear these passages in English? Yeah. Oh, so this is, wow. You're very lucky. I'm lucky. <laughs> Everyone's lucky. Okay, great. <laughs> so uh, going around to all these computer shops in like the PC capital of Tokyo, uh, asking around for hours and hours, he was only told by the salespeople no, you wouldn't be able to do that with a computer over and over. So he figured that as far as, you know, incorporating computers into his music to do some audiovisual stuff, that uh, basically it was just hopeless. But in a kind of synchronicity, on the way home on the train, he ran into a guy he knows, and he just references the guy by the letter M in the book. But he told M about losing hope in the computer shops, and M replied, have you seen the Amigo? Now, to quote Susumu from his book, Huh? Amiga? Words st started firing out of M's mouth. It seemed the Amiga was a computer that, for whatever reason, wasn't sold in Akihabara. M went on and on about what the Amiga could do. But I had just painfully learned the limits of computers in my tour of Akihabara, that they could only beep like a telegram, and they were either only black and white or could only show poor resolution still images in eight colors. Movement like video was out of the question. So I wasn't really ready to believe him. He then told me that if I, if I came with him to his house, he could show me a videotape recording of some Amiga output. This kept getting more and more fishy. I had just been told in Akihabara that a device to output computer video to videotape would cost tens of thousands of dollars. But I figured I would just play along with it because I had some free time. But what happened next was not just talk. And it wasn't about whether you believe or don't believe. It simply happened. When we arrived at M's apartment, a light was blinking, showing that he had a message waiting for him. He hit play, and a programmer friend's voice spoke. Wow, they're selling the Amiga 1000 for $500. If you know someone who wants one, I'll call and get them to sell to us. There's only five left. 
Now this guy is lying. Are these two trying to scam me? Who the hell would believe $500? I mean, I had just learned in Akihabara that I could spend tens of thousands and still not get what, get what I want. Meanwhile, M was all smiles setting up the video. He asked, what are you going to do? You going to buy one? As he pressed play. This has got to be nonsense. It has to be. <laughs> <laughs> this just sounds so much like a scam. It actually sounds like that kind of a setup. Like, no. And, you know, the message is waiting there. <laughs> yep. It really does seem like it. So it's it's believable that he would have that response to it. Yeah, right. And later, he talked in a video about how when he actually went to the shop to buy the Amiga, that it was two guys in an apartment. And they had what are called punch perms, which is like a haircut of like a punk or a thug. So all the the whole way, it just seemed like a scam. Wow, that's like a cyberpunk. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> cool. So impressed play and Amiga fans would, of course, recognize Susumu's description of the video. He was watching a recording of the Juggler demo, a 3D ray traced looping video of a robot juggler complete with realistic reflections in 4096 colors and running at 30 frames per second with sampled sound effects. Susumu continues, After I became an Amiga user, whenever anyone called me a liar, I had the ultimate weapon to instantly shut them up, the priceless treasure of the juggler. He spends the next page or two turning from disbelief to frantically asking M to set him up to buy one. He and a friend, Susumu and a friend, who was the owner of a music studio, bought what he believes were the first two Amigas to make their way into the music business in Japan. And of course, Susumu went on to create CGI video with his Amiga for his music and concerts and the music videos that we talked about earlier. He used Amigas to run MIDI gear in his sound setup. He also used the Amiga to create interactive aspects to his live shows and so on. And that was all based on a $500 computer purchased in 1987. And given his long lasting love and use of the Amiga, he also released what I think is the official boot up sound for one of the latest versions of the Amiga operating system. Maybe the most humorous part of the book to me is that after he figures out how to do real-time video output on the Amiga, most people in the video world didn't believe him, and he had a really hard time finding a company that would just let him use their recording equipment to put to tape what the Amiga was putting out. One computer shop owner told him he must be confused that computers can't do that. And even when Susumu showed the man an advertisement for an Amiga device to do full-color, real-time video, full color being 16 million colors instead of the Amiga's standard 4096 colors. The owner told him he was mistaken and that it was a frame buffer. In other words, the only thing the owner could believe is that you output one picture from the Amiga to the buffer, then record that as one frame of video, and then repeat that process one frame at a time, sort of like stop motion animation. The fact of real-time video like the Amiga could do just didn't seem possible to anyone. So people like me and Susumu, it sounds strange, but we were running video editors on our Amigas in the 1980s, and I was making 30 frame per second renderings in full color and recording them to videotape in the early 90s. I know you saw some of those videos. Yeah, so when you started doing that, though, you were, you were a kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I was 14 when I first got a device that let you put photos and video into the Amiga. That was a kind of world's first. With computers in the 80s and even in part of the 1990s, they were sort of closed off from the world. You couldn't get something like a photo into the computer, and you couldn't get the computer to do something like render a photo. And same thing with sound. Those were things that really were among the many first that the, the Amiga brought to computing at home. And of course, once you were able to do that, then you could take something like a video or a photo and digitally process it inside the computer and then output it back to videotape. And the thing about videotape back then, of course, was that, you know, you could share it with people. So you could create and then share anywhere. It could be giving a tape of music you made to a friend or playing a video that you made on, say, you know, an auditorium projector. 
things that would have been impossible with any other machine. I remember most of the pictures and video that you saw that I had put on videotape, they were from my first Amiga, which was $500. I bought it with a crappy side job I had uh, while I was in middle school. I saved up money <laughs> and just picked it up. <laughs> you know? And like Susumu said, I looked, it, I looked it up back then, and it actually was, I think I recall, $16,000 just for a device that would allow you to put a uh, PC output to video. And I don't even think that type of device existed for Apple. So for us Amigans, what that computer allowed us to do in the late 80s and early 90s just really filled us with excitement. And Susumu's book is a kind of testament of the impact it made on him. He's, a, of course, a musician famous both in Japan and overseas. And here he is writing a 400-page book decades later about the Amiga. You, know, you once joked that my first true love was not a girl, but a computer. And <laughs> it's true. And I think it's true in an important way. You know, the computer is called Amiga, which means girlfriend in Spanish. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it was really my first muse. And, you know, that sort of really tickles me given that I'm in the, this kind of future world in Tokyo now, and uh, that my, my first muse was an electronic one, sort of really appeals to the, uh, the cyberpunk in me, and also to the ideas I wrote about in The Delicate War, about how technology does not have to be like an H.R. Giger machine, you know, that's uh, eternally raping us, that it can also be something that can raise us up. Well, now you're starting to sound a little like Ken Wilber. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you, one of the things he was saying is that the in, in his interpretation of the Matrix movies uh -huh. was that the kind of monstrous demonic aspect that the machines had taken on mm -hmm. was a kind of effect of alienation. And in the right context, all that technology could be seen, even AI could be seen as um, a spirit. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's quite similar, I think, to some of the messages that are in the anime film Rojin Z, again, which I wrote about in The Delicate War, but uh, enough about that. <laughs> yeah. So one thing, just going back to Apple, over the years, they had a bunch of different slogans that would have actually made sense on the Amiga, like Think Different. That was a, a big one. And they also had the computer for the rest of us and engineered for the creative class you know the apple computers while they've always been interesting in certain ways they've always been overpriced and they've always come with a walled garden whether it was that you know in the 1980s all kinds of companies were making printers you know but you could only buy an apple printer to use with your apple computer and both the computer and the printer would be overpriced <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, i i fell victim to that i was one of those like <laughs> quote unquote creative people with his apple <laughs> yeah so i don't remember the exact prices but i if i would had to guess i would say that something like an app a good apple and a good apple printer would might have run you around five thousand dollars that was that was how it was in the mid 80s to early 90s and so well that walled garden has continued today my wife uh, runs uses an iphone and the kinds of things that the hoops that i have to jump through when i um, when i have to help her out with stuff it drives me crazy but you know with with the amigo users like myself and susumu many many others found new ways of expression new artistic frontiers at home just for the joy of it, you know? While today, the kids buy a MacBook and learn Photoshop to become what they call a creative. I don't know when that adjective to noun changeover happened, <laughs> but it's just this, you know, we are creatives and it's all about, you know, industry. That's, that's actually a big point, I think. Well, wait, didn't you say the slogan for Mac was think different? Yeah. So it wasn't think differently? Because uh, I'm wondering. If, yeah, I think it was think different, right? <laughs> right. Well, that that I wonder if that's part of their chic, like that's part of the game that they play is 
Because I remember when you said it, well, shouldn't it be think differently? And I'm like, well, maybe that maybe saying think different is part of the way of supposedly thinking differently. Right. And I mean, what does different actually mean in that case? Right. We all buy in. We we all buy into the image of who it is to be creative by buying these overpriced computers <laughs> that are made by, you know, people where they have to have a suicide nets set up to keep them from committing suicide. Like this whole idea of uh, a, co- a commodification of being different in a standardized <laughs> right, right. <laughs> cook, cookie cutter form. Standardizing being different. <laughs> yeah. Put me down for that one. <laughs> Put a check in that box for me, please. I'll fork over more money for it. <laughs> Right. So with I think that there's a really good dividing line there between Amiga users and their sort of everyday creativity at home and what you get with these sort of industrial creatives that are, you know, just doing it for a job. And one way in which you can see that is that the Amiga had the largest free software library among all computer types all the way up until I think 1996 when the library for Linux got big enough to beat it. But that was 11 years later and I don't know how many years it took for the PC to catch up for Windows and the Mac. I think the Mac is probably still trying to catch up. You know, the important point of that is that virtually everyone who had an Amiga was driven to create with it. And so that free software, which is still on the internet today called AmiNet, It's filled with music and pictures and videos and games and all kinds of things that Amiga users made with their computers. There was just something about it that called out for you to create with it. And that huge library, which was just, you know, Amiga users contributing what they had made with their Amigas, was a testament to the fact that thousands and thousands of people were actually being creative by using the computer. So it really was that what Apple did is they brought professional layout in word processing and such to the office. But the Amiga revolutionized audio and video, you know, music, photos, video, etc. Do it yourself production at home. And that's basically forgotten. But that comparison is, you know, you're talking about corporate work versus individual creativity. And so I think despite Apple's loud marketing that actually succeeded, the Amiga was actually the more impactful creative computer. So you could say, based on what you're saying with this giant free library, Amiga was played a key role in the birth of the kind of copy left movement. Uh, yeah, absolutely. As opposed to co- as opposed to copyright. I mean, when you say that, people think of Linux, but right, right. But it really the Amiga kind of got that started because before that you didn't have all this. I mean, because it was birthed with that new medium. It's being birthed with the internet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that fact that I just mentioned would surprise a lot of Linux people that there was a time for about 10 years when the Amiga had more free software than Linux. Right. You know, there were certain things about the computer that were closed source and so on. It was only made by one company or one group of people, you could say. But yeah, there were a lot of, uh, you know, resemblances between the Amiga and Linux, especially in terms of the user base. So the so the true grassroots computer is really the Amiga. It's yeah, it's along with Linux. Uh, that's true. I think the difference is that in the 80s and 90s, Linux was tied to a lot of different types of hardware that really couldn't do anything in comparison, you know, with the Amiga. The Amiga had a special hardware layout where the CPU worked in cooperation with a number of coprocessors. And they were all geared towards allowing things like, you know, video and music to happen. Whereas with a PC at the time, you were happy to get like, you know, four colors of rectangles jerkily moving around the screen. There was a huge difference in terms of that type of power. And so in the 80s and 90s, I guess the Amiga kind of had a head start in that, you know, people could actually do some pretty high level creations with it. Man, did everyone miss the boat? (laughs) Yeah, it's what's really strange is how unknown the Amiga is. Commodore, which basically bought the Amiga, did a lot to screw it up. And it was much, it was uh, really known well in Europe, but there were certain things about it 
that made the Amiga more powerful in in America. And that had to do with its sort of hand in hand fit with the video standard used in America. That's uh, NTSC. So it was a little bit more used as a game gaming machine in Europe. But you can probably ask just about any European and they would know about the Amiga, but that wouldn't be true for the U.S. And of course, a lot of that had to do with Apple had the fanfare of a one million dollar Ridley Scott commercial to you know, put themselves on the map with the first Mac. But it was actually the Amiga that was, for example, being used. I mean, this is kind of unprecedented. You had a home computer being used to do things like Hollywood CGI scenes. The Amiga was used for the CGI effects for the first season of uh, Babylon 5. And probably quite surprising to a lot of people, Jurassic Park. I think the CGI in that film holds up even today. And while at that time the the Amiga was too slow to, for Hollywood to use to render the actual frames, they gave that work to some really expensive computers. But the the modeling of the dinosaurs and the setting of the scenes and all of that was made on the Amiga. The Amiga was used in the production of Titanic. It's just kind of crazy to think about that, you know, a very, very inexpensive, I mean, you could call it dirt cheap home computer was being used in these huge places. Another use was in uh, TV stations. They were running like uh, switchers, video switchers, and the on-screen guides for what was coming on on all of the channels and stuff. That was like all Amiga in uh, the, the mid to late 90s. I even I spoke with uh, one person at a TV station. I was like, so are you still using Amigas? Because I saw some telltale signs on the screen that, you know, alerted me to the fact that they were using them. And he said now that they had actually replaced the Amigas with something so much more powerful. And I asked him about that. And it was a $60,000 computer. So it was basically like you could go Amiga or, you know, the next step up with something like $60,000. Oh, I should add too. This is just a kind of funny anecdote, but given the sort of cyberpunk nature of what we've been talking about, the the best uh, book on the making of Blade Runner was uh, written on an Amiga. Oh, yeah? <laughs> that one is called Future Noir. But yeah, so the Amiga was incredibly unknown. There's, there's that TV show, Halt and Catch Fire, which is a really good show. Uh, but they left the Amiga completely out of computer history, as other books and websites have done. Neil Stevenson, who is one of my favorite science fiction authors, wrote a sort of essay, maybe half essay, half book on the history of computing, and the Amiga was gone from that as well. What what, what is good? I mean, this almost sounds Orwellian to me. <laughs> I mean, do they do all these people not know about the Amiga, or is this a wink to somebody? What? Why are they leaving it out? Like, for example, why would it be left out of Halt and Catch Fire? Right. Well, I guess it might really just come down to, you know, the like Apple and Windows, you know, they really wanted to keep that kind of narrative that it was the entire home computer world was a competition between those two. Right, right. I think one could make a case that while the Amiga was the cheapest and most powerful computer of, you know, a certain decade or even longer. The Amiga had a uh, preemptive multitasking, which was really important. It had that from July in 1985. And then Windows 95 was the first to get it 10 years later. And the Mac got it in 2001. So that was, it was 16 years ahead of Apple. But it wasn't like preemptive multitasking was, was something that the Preemptive multitasking didn't start with the Amiga. It, you know, it started with, you know, some other computer in the past, some other operating system in the past. And the people in charge of creating the Amiga's, you know, hardware and software thought that was the right direction to go. And they just happened to be right 10 and 16 years earlier than Windows and Apple, respectively. And so you could say that, uh, you know, about a lot of things that like the Amiga didn't really originate it, but it just did it the best compared to other computers for, you know, 10 or 15 years. And that it didn't really leave a legacy because of that. It was just ahead of its time until it wasn't. 
So in a certain respect, there is a way that you could frame it as it's not that it's a kind of corporate dominance where they have a favorite narrative, but it kind of just got relegated to obscure history, largely because Commodore dropped the ball. Right. That's definitely an aspect of it. You know, Commodore wasn't a very good company at the time, especially with, you know, it was like CEO, CEOs taking private jets to the Bahamas all the time. And stuff <laughs> like that. You know, it was. Uh, so there's a little bit of being like ahead of the curve and then being too grandiose about it and maybe getting too relaxed. And meanwhile, you're not manning all the forts. Right. Well, it wasn't Commodore that made the Amiga. That's like that's an important point. You know, they right. simply decided to buy it and advertise it and sell it. But, you know, their their CEOs were stealing and there was kind of internal sabotage in certain ways. The Amiga really needed to be updated to to have upgrades in order to keep it ahead of its time. And Commodore just didn't really follow through with that. It just seems like they had no idea that they were supposed to tend to the Amiga, to its users, and keep it going like that. So it's the people who, it's the company that bought the Amiga and then basically didn't really manage it properly. Right. Yeah, a lot of probably the majority of users that had a feel for the times felt a, a feeling of abandonment by the company. Didn't you at some point say there was an Easter egg that they put put there by the programmers where it says they we made it, they fucked it up? Right, exactly. Yeah, there was a certain uh, key combination you could do that would make that message appear on screen. <laughs> that was true in a lot of ways throughout the whole history. But what is really true is that it felt for a long time when using the Amiga that we were living in the future. And that shows in, for example, the name of Susumu's book in Japanese translates to something like the, the future that never came. There's another Amiga book called The Future Was Here. There's just that general sense you know, that you had, and it was just because it actually was in so many ways ahead of its time, whether it was the preemptive multitasking or the way the processor worked with the coprocessors to allow things like real-time video and music. There were just a lot of ways. It was like living in the future, and not only were you able to live in the future, but you were able to do it very cheaply. I just saw a recent interview with Kanye West, and you know, I think that he he uh, came up poor, and he said that he got his musical start on the Amiga. Oh, really? You know, I was prompted by a discussion with you to actually watch the Mother of All Demos. Oh, yeah. And I kind of had that sense, like the future was all was there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to see the kinds of things that they do. I mean, you could you could probably add some CGI to that video and make it appear as if that was recorded yesterday. You know, they're using a mouse and copy and paste and touch screen and all of that. That's why, to me, there were really two revolutions to actual computers. And the first is the era of the late 60s to early 70s, when the mother of all demos came out. That was 1968, I think, with uh, Douglas Engelbart and the guys at the Stanford Research Institute. And then I think in the same year was the Grail demo where you could see, I mean, this is 1968, right? And they, they have touch screen control and handwriting and recognition and natural gestures. You know, those are things that really just sort of came about with the smartphone. But this was 1968. And they also had prototype virtual reality machine going half a century ago. And we still don't even have a good VR system today. So to me, that was the first revolution. And the second was the Amiga. Strong words, I guess, but with the huge list of firsts for a home computer, you know, that you could do, you know, photorealistic displays or whatever, and that it was inexpensive. So it put those powers into the hands of people in their homes where it, who were able to create with it and express themselves through various forms of art. I, like I said, I, I bought mine from a, a job I had in middle school, and then I was creating electronic music with synths and samples and doing digital painting and 3D rendering, writing code, what have you. It was a really powerful thing. And there would have been no other way for me to, you know, experience that. And so that's why, at least, you know, personally, those are the two computer revolutions to me. 
makes a lot of sense. It uh, I noticed at, when, at, at the opening of the Mother of All Demos, uh-huh. uh, it actually says Research Center for Augmenting Human Intellect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and is that where we are today? I looked at some of the comments under the Mother of All Demos, and one guy said, this guy was literally 30 plus years ahead of his time. He's even got a gamer headset on. <laughs> Someone else wrote, why is this 45-year-old pre-webcam stream clearer than my 2013 Skype? <laughs> and then the most interesting was actually a quote from uh, Schopenhauer. Talent hits a target no one else can hit genius hits a target no one else can see (laughs) yeah that's great yeah but in this case it's it's not only is it a target that no one else could see but it was a target that a lot of people still couldn't see afterwards and still don't see still don't see yeah absolutely (laughs) (laughs) yeah there are a lot of ways in which what we're doing now is a kind of downgrade of that and it's so complicated. I don't really want to get into, you know, speculating as to why or how that happened. But somehow we just ended up with a lot of compromises. And well, to be honest, humans are really bad at writing software. It's really difficult to do things right. And while the philosophy was kind of set down for computer science very early and you saw a lot of people following interesting philosophies in the 1960s. It all just kind of crumbled on compromises and bad software. Okay, so you got two uh, two ideas: compromises and bad software. Mm-hmm. So are the com- were the are the compromises related to just basically how the market functions, or where do the compromises come from? That's definitely one type. You have, like, rather than someone going, okay, let's just design the greatest computer there ever was. It's like, no, basically everyone has just decided that you can just use it and throw it out, get a newer one later. No one is really going for the highest quality anymore. I mean, I have certain pieces of technology in my house that are from the early 90s. And I'm still using them, you know, 30 years later, and they still work well. And I don't think that you could really say anything about anything like that about the things that are being made today. So what you're touching on there is the issue of planned obsolescence. Well, I wouldn't say planned. To me, it's basically that the market demand is for cheap, cheap, cheap. And in order to do that, you have to you have to compromise on the, you know, the, the lifetime of the equipment. Okay, so it's not made to break down. It's just made in the what they see as the most cost-effective way, which means that it inevitably will break in a short period of time. Right. There's something like fast, cheap, and durable. Pick two. I get it. And there were compromises also in terms of the various philosophies for how to do things. Well, let me see if I can give a quick rundown of a few ways in which compromise happens. First, with a large software project, the odds of everyone doing everything right and in line with some overarching principles are really, really slim. You could say that that idea and a few others I'll mention are where theoretical principles meet the ugly reality. Another example is that sometimes the hardware isn't up to it. You know, if you implement the idea with correct principles, the hardware runs it too slowly. So then you need a hack or a kludge for it to work. And then in a real world scenario, Windows 3.1 was originally built on DOS and DOS couldn't access more than 640 kilobytes of RAM, a paltry sum. And because Windows was built on top of DOS, Windows also couldn't access more RAM. Of course, I know you old school PC guys are thinking of HiMem.sys and all of that fun, but So they needed to make kludges to get greater functionality in Windows. And then even worse in terms of the compromise is that they built later versions of Windows on top of Windows 3.1 in order to maintain backwards compatibility. And then when a new version was built on top of 3.1, then the next version after that would be built on top of that. It just kept building up. Backwards compatibility was one of the key phrases of that computer era because they kept upgrading the CPU and the operating system, and you would just run into problems where the software that people were used to using would just fail to work. 
but by taking Microsoft's tack of just building the new thing on top of the old, it ended up that you needed a compromise in the code. They well, there's a there was a joke running around in you know the, the 1990s that when Windows finally got their 16-bit operating system out, that you know it was a 16-bit operating system running on top of an 8-bit operating system, which was actually running on top of a 4-bit operating system. And then of course the joke was that it, that all of it was made by a 2-bit company. <laughs> <laughs> So that kind of inefficiency and bloat in the code came from that historical process of trying to maintain compatibility with the past while upgrading for the future. And Apple had to switch platforms twice, so it had a different set of problems. Rather than building versions on top of versions, they just left the old one behind and started from scratch on the new platform. And they did that going from the Motorola 68000 series of CPUs to Motorola's PowerPC series by implementing an emulator in the operating system that would emulate the earlier 68000 processor. So people using older Apple computers could buy a new one and still be able to use their old software through that emulation built into the operating system. Then I believe they did similarly when they went to the same hardware that PCs run on. So there today really isn't any difference, you know, between a, a Mac and a PC other than, you know, the operating system is running on it. The price. <laughs> yeah. Right. There really isn't that much of a, a choice in terms of any of the types of hardware architectures that you might want to talk about. Actually, the Amiga ran into the same problem. When Motorola ended the 68000 series, the Amiga was in the same position as Apple. But it, they fixed it a little differently. Some Amiga-related companies released dual CPU boards that would include the original 68000 series, typically the final one, the 68060, and a PowerPC CPU. So you could run them both at the same time, and that was actually very powerful. But I think even Apple's approach was better than the way Windows was built on top of previous versions way up until... I think they did that almost until 2010. It was really hacky and kludgy and, I mean, just horrible from, you know, a software philosophy perspective. And then you had them turn it around and brag about how many lines of code were in Windows, which is, you know, basically the more lines of code, the slower it's going to be. I mean, that's a, a, a kind of over overly simplistic metric, but in general, you could say that's true. So, I mean, they were bragging about, you know, that this thing was just bloated and slow. Well, um, I heard you once remark that people used to say the fastest Mac is an Amiga. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's true. That's really funny, right? The original 68,000 line of processors, CPUs from Motorola that both the Amiga and Mac used, the Mac switched over to PowerPC, leaving, they didn't use the, the last 68,000 CPU that Motorola created, but you could install that on the Amiga and you could run a Mac emulator. So you could run all of the, you know, Mac software on the Amiga through that emulator. But because of the preemptive multitasking, you could also be running Amiga stuff simultaneously with the Mac stuff. And because they used the same CPU, the emulator didn't have to emulate the CPU. It only had to emulate the things about the Mac that, that were different from the Amiga. And so that made it incredibly fast. And because you could use a faster CPU that hadn't found its way to the Mac. Actually, there's a video on YouTube of a guy named Retro Man Cave. That's one word. And he did a video showing the fastest Amiga versus the fastest Mac. And, you know, the, it, it's true. The, the Amiga ran the Mac software faster than the Mac did, while also being capable of simultaneously running the um, Amiga software. You could put it like this. If you, if you had a Mac at the time, you could run one task at a time. Well, if you had the Amiga, you could run, say, 100 tasks at a time, with one of them being a Mac. And on top of that, you could buy five Amigas for the price of one Mac. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of crazy. <laughs> and Mac won the image war. <laughs> right. Wow. Now, that's obviously with an upgraded Amiga. You need the, you know, the fastest CPU that was uh, made by Motorola at the time. Right. But 
I still think that at the time buying the the Amiga that you needed and the CPU upgrade, it would still be cheaper than the Mac and it would be faster than the Mac and have multitasking, which the Mac didn't have at the time. Well, but I, I mean, like being 16 years ahead, that's pretty significant, isn't it? <laughs> right. I mean, in in the world of technology, in the world of computers to be 16 years ahead, it's like it's unheard of. It's crazy. I, I really wonder. I wonder why Apple was so slow to adopt the preemptive multitasking. I wonder if it had to do with all of the the different times they had to change their hardware to keep up with the the present while keeping their older users happy that you know the new machines were compatible with their old software maybe it had something to do with that. I found the I found the pricing this is just for like you know the stock machines you know nothing added just a sort of bare bones machines. The IBM PC XT was $2,145 in 1986. It was $2,495 for the original Mac in 1984. And it was $1,295 for the Amiga 1000 in 1985. And Susumu mentioned that he bought his Amiga 1000 in 1987 for $500. So, yeah, going by those prices, I mean, I'm sure, I guess the Mac might have uh, dropped in price in those three years, but the Amiga 1000 and Amiga 500, in both in 1987, were one-fifth of the price of the Mac. And the Mac was probably 20% higher in cost than the IBM PC, and the IBM PC was overpriced to begin with. For that money, you really didn't get anything at all. It's, uh, it's kind of crazy thinking about it. I mean, you know, even today to think about spending $2,500 for a computer, that's a lot. And that's in 1987 money, you know, so we're talking about even more. Like, it might be like, what, $4,000 in today's money? Almost like the price of a car. And, I mean, the Mac could only display two colors, black and white. Well, I think one thing as far as what people were willing to spend, it was also based on what they knew. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And there's, I think there is some truth to that. Probably Apple and Microsoft did some advertising that, I mean, Commodore didn't really help out in this regard, but they kind of made it seem like the Amiga was a toy. This this is an image that was promoted by Apple. And is that what you're saying? This, this image is promoted by Apple or... Yeah, I'm not. I, I I wouldn't say you know that like yeah, this was like some sort of advertising plan by Apple or whoever. But when when the Amiga was brought up in in media, like say for example, magazines that were centered around the you know the PC, you'd get those kinds of sentiments that the Amiga was a toy and that the you know the PC is serious. You know, it's for serious work. You can get things done. <laughs> you know. At the time, there was that phrase that got thrown around, you know, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. There was a lot of IBM, Big Blue, you know, they're the serious machine. And then, you know, Apple had to come along with their advertising and try to differentiate themselves and be like, yeah, IBM and Microsoft and all them, they're really stuffy. We're like the, you know, the cool creative types think different, blah, blah, blah. That was kind of the, the imagery that was going on at the time. Right, and the real computer was way in the background, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. The IBM, uh, IBM's first home computer. Uh, th- this might not be a hundred percent true. I haven't really looked for the references, but I believe what happened is that IBM they were basically just focused on mainframes and uh, you know corporate computing and that kind of thing. But then they saw all these young upstarts coming out with home computers and making money. And they were like, oh, we have to get a home computer out, too. And so they gave a team of rather inexperienced people too little time and too little money to make their home computer entry. And, you know, you compare that to the the creation of the Amiga, which was a, a team of veterans spending years and years trying to make the computer that they would want to use. And yeah, you you see it in, you know, the performance differences. I mean, I said, you know, the Mac could only do two colors. At that time, the IBM PC could only display 16 at most. 
we had an IBM PC in our house at that time, but it, it couldn't do 16. It could only do four colors because it hadn't been upgraded from a CGA to an EGA video card. So two colors on the Mac four or 16 on the IBM, and then 4,096 on the Amiga. It was the only computer among them that could do photorealistic images. And the IBM and Mac really didn't have any kind of sprite hardware that could move things around the screen smoothly. It was maybe like two or three frames per second you could get moving stuff, which is just extremely jerky. You know, to get the persistence of vision effect where it actually seems like motion, the minimum frame rate is around 12 frames per second. And the IBM on the Mac couldn't even approach 12. And the Amiga was regularly doing 30 frame per second and 60 frame per second video. I think I showed you a movie, like a Hollywood movie, playing on an Amiga using its 4096 color mode and stereo sound. And you could actually watch that today. Do you remember the video? Yes, I do. Yeah. If anyone wants to try it, look up on YouTube, IBM PC 1987, and you're just going to get beeps and boops and a couple colored rectangles moving slowly and jerkily around the screen. It was just night and day. Right. That's what I was going to say. This reminds me a lot of Edison and Tesla. Yeah, that's um, that's a good connection to make. Right. Well, basically, Tesla is like the now is the most popular mysterious figure on the Internet who represents what could have been, you know? Right. Right. Yeah, there's definitely an Amiga connection there. The way I see it, I mean, obviously, with Tesla, it could have been different. But, you know, the way I described it before, the Amiga was way ahead of its time and somehow did it so cheaply. But then it was only ahead of its time until it wasn't. It, it just had that, you know, that moment in history. And so maybe for Tesla, it would have been the same. Maybe some of the inventions that he had and some of the difference, differences in philosophy that he had with Edison, if implemented, would have created a, you know, a better world for, you know, the next 30 years or something. But who knows if it would have left a legacy, probably pissing off a whole lot of Amiga users. But I don't really think that the the Amiga has left much of a legacy. Yeah, I see I see what you mean. The sense that I'm getting from this is that so much of it there's the issue of the image war and then there's this classic gap between engineers and management. Yeah. And this is the managerial class being so out of touch and no matter what you give them over a certain period of time, they could screw it up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even the way that you described the home computer, um, what was that? Was that IBM's home computer? Yeah. Um, that the first one that basically it wasn't conceived in, in the optimal way. Right. You said not enough time, not enough money, inexperienced people. Yeah. It's, um, it's kind of like that uh, song from Pink Floyd, The Final Cut, Not Now John, where you have to keep going. Not Now John, we got to get on with the film show, Hollywood Waits at the End of the Rainbow. Where everything is just keep it just keeps moving really quickly and you don't really have time to stop and think. Mm, right. Well, if I had to guess, I would say that that's probably true, that, you know, that's the way that the, the IBM's first home computer came about. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the, the functionality of it, it certainly matches. But then you have to ask why, you know, why was the the Mac so poor compared to the Amiga? The Mac came first. It was 1984. But of course, the Mac didn't actually come first. It's well known, you know, Steve mm -hmm. Jobs went out to, was it Palo Alto, where uh, Xerox Park was located and saw their graphical user interface, saw their mouse controlling the computer and so on. And, you know, he just like stole that and told everyone else in Apple, hey, this is what we're going to do. So I think really it just comes down to that the Apple guys were a little a little earlier and they were just copying from the past. Xerox Park was doing stuff with like computer mice in 1979, but we saw that with the mother of all demos in 1968. Mother of all demos. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. You could see that in mother of all demos. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think what the Amiga designers did was quite revolutionary. They actually thought about the future. They didn't look to the past and what, you know, Xerox and uh, SRI, you know, what they were doing. 
they just were like, okay, what kind of computer do we want to build? What what should it be capable of? And they created that aim and they went for it. And they succeeded. They succeeded in creating what was generally the, the most powerful computer out there. You, you couldn't even make a case that the, the IBM PC or, or Mac was in its league for audio visuals. Well, I feel like this is a multifaceted critique of the market system in a way, but also a, a multifaceted cautionary tale. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, there's a lot to learn from how things panned out. You could say cautionary. You could also say, hey, couldn't we get a group of people together today that want to do the same thing? And might it change a lot, if not everything? I don't know. Right. But th- th- this time, keeping your eye on the on the ball, <laughs> which goes back to, yeah, so both cautionary tale and also inspiration. Yeah, on that note, if anyone's interested in, you know, computer history or seeing how different the Amiga actually was, I haven't even really hit on anything technically about just some of the fantastic things that it was capable of. But check out some YouTube tutorials. And I would also encourage people to learn more about computers in general. Back in the 80s and 90s, you needed to know a lot more about computing to get a computer to do what you wanted. You know, it's like today with like swiping on screens and stuff. My two year old daughter figured out how to bring up VLC and, you know, the video player and, you know, choose like the shows and stuff that she wanted to watch at two years old. Back in the 80s, certain things, you actually had to type commands into the computer. And back then, a lot of nerds, as you would call them, became enchanted by the idea of figuring all of that out. But once these technologies became mainstream, you know, you needed more simple ways to do things, and the interface became the lot of it. So there's a divide today. On one side, you have people that know what the actual technology is, and then those that just use the technology. Just like 99% of people who drive cars have no idea how a car works, and there's the 1% who repair them. But there's a huge difference that I'm talking about, and that's that the entire world runs on computers. If you can really figure out how they work, you can figure out new ideas that will run the world, that can lead it in new directions. So do you want to just try to wing the outro and see what happens? Yeah, I think winging the outro is a good idea. We could say, if we were going to record an outro, then maybe we should say this and that. Yeah, like, you've been listening to Phenomenumina with co-hosts Ray, I am he. And Gino. Yeah, well, we could do it like that. Yeah, and then we could direct them to all the places where the podcast would be found. Spotify, iTunes, wherever they are. And, you know, check out our webpage, phenomenumina.com. What about using this? Can we use this? Yeah, I think maybe we should use this. <laughs>